you, you describe in the book that Neanderthals as being the cousins of, of Homo sapiens, so they're our cousins. Can you take us even further back to our joint ancestry? Who were our forefathers and others? It's a really, it's a really tough question. Um, the DNA suggests that at around 530, 540,000 years ago, we have a common ancestor. And this was probably a hominin that came out of Africa. Um, and we, remaining in Africa, evolved in our own separate way. And these other people, um, led, to, uh, led to the uh, arrival of Neanderthals in um, places like Western Europe and the Levant and so on. And so we were separated from that point. So who these, um, who these people were, who these hominins were that are our common ancestors is not known with certainty yet. We have some possibilities. One possibility, for example, for many years was a hominin called Homo heidelbergensis. Um, but there's still a great deal of work um, that, that is being done here. For example, recent dating work suggests that Homo heidelbergensis could have survived much later than we thought and therefore would not necessarily be uh, the common ancestor for us both. So there's still a great deal of work to be done and most of the focus of the world's paleoanthropologists now is tending to focus on Africa because it's here that I think we're going to find um, some of the answers to, this, to these riddles. How far back do you have to go to find apes in our lineage? Um, well, um, that's a very that's a very good question. Most of the time, we're looking at um, you know five to six million years ago before you get to a common ancestor that is split from apes. In fact, it could even be older than that. It's something that's very strongly debated. It's it's usually the case that you're looking at about six to seven million years ago, but it could be much older than that. Um, we simply don't know yet. And do we know how far back it was that someone that we would recognise as sort of almost human yeah. was was walking the earth yeah so again um that's a, a very tough question some of the um earliest evidence that we have for homo sapiens are, come from a site in morocco called jebel -er hood and these um the, the people that we find there um are not exactly like us but they're on the pathway to us and this is a, a at about three hundred thousand years ago and then Fast forwarding a little bit later than that, at around 190, 160 to 190,000 years ago in East Africa, we find humans that um, are looking much more similar to us. But the problem is that there's no one moment in evolutionary time when you find the, the, the one, if you know what I mean, because it's a very long gradation. It's a, it, it's, a, it's a long period of time and we get lucky because the fossil record is extremely patchy. But I think it's fair to say that probably between about 150 to 250,000 years ago is when we uh, get the, the, the first um, hints in the fossil record of people starting to appear that look um, anatomically um, similar to, to, to us today. Given that we as a species fanned out from Africa originally, how do you explain as an archaeologist that the dramatic differences in skin color? Why, why are we not all black skinned? Yeah, so um, what you often find here is that, um, is that these, types of, um, uh, these types of adaptations can happen very quickly. And there's a still a great deal to be learned about this. And so for example, um, recent work that um, has been um, undertaken in this part of the world suggests that at around um, 10,000 years ago, early people that moved into the British Isles uh, at the end of the glacial period. So that's this period of extreme glacial ice age cold that lasted until about 14,700 years ago, whereupon the climate suddenly warmed up. So that these people that we find actually had very dark skin and blue eyes predominantly. Um, and, then, uh, and then later, it was only after that, that the, um, the, the, the presence of, um, of lighter skin um, appeared. And so it's, it's very difficult to, um, to know the reasons um, exactly why this happened. And, and we, we're also very interested to know, of course, what Neanderthals um, and what other um, hominins looked like. And you may have seen in the reconstructions that I showed um, earlier, some very interesting um, um, artistic representations of this. It turns out that skin tone is actually, um, it's actually quite difficult to, um, to diagnose um, based on the genes and based on the DNA alone where you have it because there are a number of, uh, of genes that play a role, a number of um, parts of the genome that play a role in this. But certainly the evidence that we're starting to get indicates that um, skin color at least um, can change quite dramatically over short um, periods of time. And most of the adaptations that we see phenotypically 
in different parts of the world are comparatively recent. You're able through your detective work in the book to work out the, the, the interests, the preoccupations of the, the, these species that you're studying. I mean, for example, the fact that I think maybe in one of the caves or one of the sites, the, 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 the wing of a, of a bird of prey was discovered or the wing bones of a bird of prey or, or some sort. And that, that would suggest that there was an interest beyond birds of prey as potentially sources of food. Yes, indeed. That, this comes back to um, what I was talking about with respect to the um, the ornaments and the you know the, the self decoration. Um, and this is a, again another very controversial area of paleoanthropology because it's always been assumed. Well, many people have assumed that these types of adaptations are the hallmark of of anatomically modern humans and not of our archaic cousins, as it were. And this uh, again has been overturned. Um, largely over the last 20 years or so, careful archaeological excavation and analysis, post-excavation analysis of some of the material that has been excavated. And what people have started to notice is that in Neanderthal uh, levels at some of these sites, that they're finding um, little pieces of evidence that suggest that Neanderthals were also very interested in these types of behaviors. So you mentioned um, birds of prey. So what they found is that on some of these big birds of prey like lammergeiers and eagles and so on, they find these little bones that have cut marks along the wing, wing parts of, the, of, of, of these um, birds that could only be um, for purposes unrelated to eating the food that comes from the bird, which aren't probably very tasty anyway. Um, and so it's been suggested that they may have been looking at uh, for feathers and they may have been interested in taking feathers to decorate themselves with. And that's, um, it's very difficult to prove that completely, but we have now about 14 sites where this type of behavior has been, um, has been shown to be the case. We also have talons from large eagles that have been cut as well and have wear patterns that suggest they may have been worn around the neck um, by um, Neanderthals. And so it's very interesting now to look back um, uh, once again at the interpretation that we had previously, which was that Neanderthals weren't capable of this kind of behavior to today, where it's starting to look as though they really did. And the other big thing that happened um, in the last few years was um, uh, new data that suggests that uh, cave paintings um, may not also be the exclusive preserve of um, Homo sapiens. Some amazing dating work was, was done in the Iberian Peninsula at three cave sites, which showed that some of the art that was um, made on these caves, which we again assumed to be modern human in origin, actually dates much earlier than the arrival of, uh, of um, Homo sapiens into, into, into Western Europe, more than 65,000 years ago actually, which suggests that it may have been Neanderthals that were doing that. So again, things are starting to change in terms of our interpretation into the capabilities of these people and, and, and how things might have unfolded when Homo sapiens first met them. What do we understand or know about language that was used by Neanderthals and Denisovans? And if the Denisovans and the Neanderthals as you've proved, were interbreeding. How were they communicating? There's, um, there is evidence that um, supports the likelihood of Neanderthals um, speaking um, some, some kind of language to one another. We know that they have the FOXP2 gene, which is very, it means that it's very difficult not to speak with um, unless you have this, um, this uh, genetic variant. Um, they also have the hyo hyoid bone in their, in their throats, which um, allows um, us and them to create um, sounds in the lower part of the of the, lar lar of the larynge. Um, and uh, I think that um, when we look at the archaeological evidence uh, on the ground, it's, it's very hard not to conceive that there wasn't um, the ability to communicate, um, probably by speech, um, to plan ahead, to, um, to, to, to have some kind of ability to, um, to communicate effectively. We see um, today um, that modern people, when they're hunting, they have ways of communicating that aren't necessarily vocal, but I think it's, I think it's likely that, um, very likely that Neanderthals and early anatomically modern humans could communicate by speech. Um, but it's unlikely that, of course, when they first met one another, they were speaking a similar language. One of the things that struck me in your presentation was the number of times you said, thank goodness someone held on to a bone, the Tibetan monk in China or whatever, whatever or whoever. I wonder, if we acknowledge the good fortune of some of the finds so far, whether that suggests that there are other finds out there that are, are yet to occur. And what I get a sense from you of 
how much mm -hmm. effort is being put into by the likes of you, archaeologists, to, to finding more? Like, do yeah. we know whether we've, we've saturated our research or is there a lot more to come? Yeah, this is a really good question. I think the answer is there is more to come. Um, a number of, um, there are a number of angles to this question. So, for example, um, over the course of the last uh, 150 years, a lot of material has been excavated, which is currently sitting in, um, you know, museum collections and, um, and, and universities. Um, often uh, fragmentary pieces of human bone, for example, have been found, and it, it's very difficult to identify exactly what they are. Using DNA now, we're able to, um, to try and understand that a lot, a lot, a lot better. And so now that we know that there are these Denisovans are around, particularly in East Asia, uh, there's been a, a bit of a rush to try and identify um, some of these older collections to see whether or not they actually are Denisovan or not. So we have some quite big um, fossil remains that um, people are looking into now. Sadly, as I, as I outline in my book, um, often the DNA isn't very well preserved and it's not preserved enough to diagnose it um, immediately. But you're right that some of the most amazing finds that we have are simply delivered to us by members of the public who, who notice something and do a good turn and don't throw a bone away. And there are, there are dozens of them. I mean, from the, the Pingu jawbone, which was fished up by a fisherman who gave it to a, um, an antique dealer in Taiwan and who then sold it to a, a young man who was interested in the look of it, who took it to a museum, who then identified it probably as... Um, as, a, as an important um, potential Denisovan, to a mammoth hunter who was hunting ivory and saw a, a human femur and thought that looks interesting and handed it to somebody, to the monk in Baishia Cave. Again and again, we have these uh, incredibly lucky finds. So yeah, there must be some more. There must be more out there to look at and to find. Um, and uh, I think it's also very um, uh, wonderful to think that if we didn't have any of these bones of Denisovans, then we would have already known about Denisovans from this amazing new development of sediment DNA. So using sediments, now it's possible to fish out DNA from the dirt and it's, it's, it's um, inevitable, it was inevitable that eventually we would have found Denisovans even without the bones because of the DNA that's extracted from the dirt now. We've got whole genomes of mitochondrial genomes of Denisovans that have been extracted from soil from Denisovan cave. It's, it's incredible. It's mind-blowing stuff. Does any of this, I mean, does the, the revelation of the Denisovan species make you think that there might, might have been another species out there? There might be another species that we should be looking for? Yeah, I think inevitably, um, in island Southeast Asia, there are lots of islands. And if we have Homo luzonensis on, on the island of Luzon, we have the hobbits on Flores. It's, it's, I think, almost certain that there are other types of humans that survived um, on other types of islands and went in their own evolutionary direction. We also have, again, evidence from the genomes that there is um, some ancient DNA that hasn't been able to be sequenced, uh, hasn't been able to be compared to modern human um, sequences or to the extinct ones that we have today. And so it's possible that these so-called ghost lineages could represent um, the remains of um, ancient um, humans that we haven't no, have no fossil evidence for yet. So this is something that people are looking at a great deal. And there was a very interesting paper recently that showed some um, in some um, modern African genomes that there was a large sections of archaic um, DNA that could conceivably belong to a human that we haven't found yet. So I think it's inevitable we're going to find more. We've got, I mean, I'm starting to lose count. I think it's about six, seven or eight, depending on how many Denisovan populations there are out there already. And I wouldn't be surprised if we can add three or four to that over the next decade, perhaps. It's really exciting to think about, isn't it? That there are other people out there that could be found. I, I couldn't believe, on the flip side of all this, I couldn't believe what I was reading in the book when, I, I, was it the, the bone, that tiny bit of bone of the first Denise that was found that went missing? Oh my God, yeah, and hasn't really been sad. found. And thank, thank the heavens that someone took very detailed photographs from which yeah. you know, cor cor corrobor corroborating stories were able to emerge. But, I mean, this is extraordinary, isn't it? Yeah, I tried to, I tried to track that down and um, um, it's, it's, there's a sort of, it, 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 it's um, a dead end really. So the bone, um, the bone was originally um, sent to a, a lab in the US. And once the mitochondrial DNA paper came out in 2010, they sent that bone to the uh, researcher in Paris who tried to extract nuclear DNA. She didn't succeed because of um, problems with the preservation of that particular sample that she had. Uh, but she did, as you say, take very high resolution CT scans and photographs that we were later able to use to reconstruct the entire bone and to, in a publication. Um, 
And then she returned the bone back to the lab in the States, whereupon the trail goes a little bit cold. Nobody knows where it is. I do know that my Russian colleagues would really like to have it back though, if possible. So if anyone knows anything, I'll drop an email to the Russian Academy of Sciences and the Siberian branch, please. I want to bring in some questions from the Q&A, some of which you've answered as you've got along, but there's, there's always a good bunch in there. But first, just give us a, a, a very, very quick tour in synopsis form of, of what of what ancient DNA, the ancient DNA process is, or ancient ge ge genomics. Like how does that work? Have you given us some examples of how your processes work, but just spell that out for us. Yeah, so, um, well, it revolves around a series of um, steps. Um, the first is to um, take a small sample of bone, the powder. So you drill it with a very sterile um, drill. And um, this is, a, you have to be very careful here because you know, you have to try and eliminate uh, as much modern human DNA contamination as you possibly can. So it's usually best done in sterile conditions. And one of the best, uh, um, the, the breakthroughs here was to ensure uh, very clean rooms that were used for doing this kind of work. Um, later, that uh, DNA is then, um, is, then, is, is then extracted using a series of chemical steps, um, using a, a process of amplification, which amplifies the amount of DNA that you've got using a process called PCR, um, polymerase chain reaction. And it's a way that you can amplify the number of the amounts of DNA that you've got in a very quick way. Nowadays, there are these very powerful um, uh, means of, of sequencing the DNA very rapidly. It, it takes now several days to uh, sequence all of the DNA that you extract and to turn that um, the, DNA, the DNA that you've um, I, um, taken from the bone into a the series of letters that you need to then sequence it. Um, so the, the, the science is now termed next generation sequencing um, because it is um, a combination of the ability to sequence vast numbers of DNA very quickly, but also new developments in chemistry, which allow you to eliminate the contamination and to focus simply on the very ancient DNA. And this is the DNA that's become degraded over time. So there are chemical tricks now that you can pull out all of the DNA that's likely to be very ancient and to purify that and to only sequence those parts of the DNA to get the sequences that are then robust and are, uh, arguably are ancient rather than ancient plus modern, which is the problem that plagued DNA um, research for, for many years prior to about 2004. 